In a previous video, I discussed externalities, what they are, what the problem is with externalities, and solutions to the externality problem. This is the classical solution to an externality problem, a negative externality problem. If there's a negative externality, tax it. If there's a positive externality, subsidize it. And this was interpreted by policymakers and economists. The best solution to an externality uh, is to either reward individuals for providing positive externalities or tax people who are imposing negative externalities on people around them. Now, Coase comes around and he says, now wait a second, if the individuals who were making the decisions could get together with the bystanders that they were harming, those individuals could come to an agreement, and upon coming to an agreement, there would be no problem with the externality, because they would be basically bargain to a mutually beneficial place. What, what did Coase actually say? Coase said that if property rights are well specified, and transaction or negotiation costs are low, the outcome is Pareto efficient. That is, that we know that as long as we specify property rights, it doesn't matter if we give property rights to the polluter or if we give property rights to the people who are being polluted upon, transaction costs are low, what's going to happen through this bargaining process is we're going to get to a point where no one can be made better off without making someone else worse off. So Coase is saying that there really is no externality problem provided that these two conditions hold. Now what Coase was also saying is that if we see that the outcome is not Pareto efficient, that there is an externality problem, one of these conditions must be violated. Either property rights weren't well specified or transaction costs were high. Uh, I maybe I was ashamed to go over to talk to my neighbor about uh, turning down the volume on, on his Def Leppard soundtrack. To see how this works, let's consider a simple example. Where a doctor and a candy maker, technically a confectioner, are located right next to each other. The doctor uh, needs silence so, so as to hear his patient's heartbeat with the stethoscope. The confectioner needs to make some noise in order to make some candy. They've got a very thin wall um, separating one of the doctor's rooms um, and the confectioner's uh, candy making room. Um, and so we, uh, we can think about uh, bargaining over the right of whether the, ca the candy man can make noise or whether the doctor can have silence. If there is silence, the candy man makes no money because he can't make any candy. And if the, and the doctor makes $400 because he can see two or three patients. If there's noise, the doctor can't hear the patient's heartbeat, so there's no reason scheduling people uh, to show up in that room. Um, and the candy man can make $200 of candy. Now, we can clearly see that if we add up the total sort of surplus from the doctor and the, and the candy man, what we would prefer to have happen. We'd like for the doctor to have silence. Uh, we get $400 of, of surplus, and if we don't care whether it goes to the doctor or the confectioner, uh, we, we, we'd rather have silence than, than to have noise. So the candy man has the right to make noise. A naive approach would be he'll just make the noise and make $200 and go home. We can envision a transfer from the doctor to the candy man. Let's suppose the doctor just transferred $250 to the candy man, said, don't come and make candy, I need my silence, it's worth more than $200 to me, I know it's worth $200 to you, I'll throw in an extra $50 and we'll both be better off. Well, to see what, how this would make them both better off, we subtract the transfer from the doctor's payoff and add it to the candy man's payoff. Candyman's happy to have silence and have a transfer of $250 per day. And the doctor's happy because he gets $150 instead of zero. Is that even though we gave the candy man the right to make noise, we get the efficient outcome. We get silence, and in total, we get $150 plus $250, $400 of surplus.
So the doctor would say, you know, I'm not willing to uh, be compensated anything less than $400. The doctor gets silence, he exercises his right to silence, and he gets $400 in surplus. 400 plus zero is 400, just what we had before, is that it didn't matter who we assigned the right. The doc if the doctor had the right, and there's $400 of surplus, all of it goes to the doctor. If the confectioner had the right, uh, and there still was $400 of total surplus between the doctor and the confectioner. If you allow for this bargaining, you can get if the efficient outcome, um, regardless of the assignment of property rights. But what matters is that the assignment of property rights is well specified. The doctor has the right. There's no doubt about that. There was doubt about that. Each individual would waste resources lobbying for their favorite, uh, favorite scenario. Now notice the doctor would like to have the right because he gets all $400 of surplus and doesn't have to pay the confectioner to relinquish his right. Now let's consider a tweak on this example. Let's suppose that the candy man has the right to make noise, but that the doctor can soundproof his room for $50. So the candy man will only relinquish the right if he's paid more than $200. The doctor values silence at up to $400. So he's willing to pay up to $400 for silence. He could soundproof the room for $50. That's cheaper for him. Uh, than it is to compensate the candy man for, uh, for the silent. This soundproof option turns out to be quite valuable at, for society as a whole. Recall, regardless of how we assigned the property rights before, total surplus was $400. In this case, it's pretty apparent that the doctor will soundproof for $50, so he's going to subtract the cost of soundproofing, he'll have $350 left over. The confectioner can make as much noise as he likes. It kind of introduces another outcome here. Silence and noise. The doctor gets to buy silence for himself, and the confectioner gets to make as much noise and candy as he likes. He gets to make $200. And what ends up happening is we get more total surplus than what we had before. The low-cost workaround here was valuable. Kosian bargaining allowed us to discover this. If we took a naive Peguvian approach, we might say that you know, the candy man is making noise, he is creating an externality on the doctor, um, and therefore, because he's creating an externality on the doctor, we should tax him so that he doesn't do it. But if we took that naive Peguvian approach, we, we would want to tax the candy man um, enough to make him to stop making noise. That's at least two hundred dollars, and so that's going to um, that's going to sort of not allow us to discover this low cost workaround, which was in the doctor's hands to discover. This drives right to the heart of what an externality problem is, and it sort of forces us to consider who is creating the externality here. On one perspective, the doctor's silence imposes an externality on the candy man. It hurts that candy man. You can think about uh, that candy man is being made worse off by not being able to exercise the right to make noise. On the other hand, the candy man, when he makes noise, his noise imposes an externality on the doctor. And so one of the things that Coase pointed out in his article was that externalities have a reciprocal nature. The value of the Coase theorem is that it allows us, through this bargaining process, to discover low-cost workarounds. It allows us to discover the efficient or inefficient allocation of resources. And so this is a, a useful way to think about externalities.